Hello and welcome to Anatomy and Beyond. I am Tanya Chamberlain from the Division of Anatomy here at the University of Leeds and in this video we are going to look at the skull and the surface anatomy. After this video you should be able to identify the surface features of the face with the underlying bony structures and identify the vulnerable regions of the adult and the infant skull. So these images should be fairly common. On the left, we have an anterior view of the skull. That is, we are looking at the skull from the front. The right of the skull is here. I know this can seem a little confusing because I'm pointing to the left side of the picture. But when thinking about anatomy, we are thinking about the patient's anatomy. So this is the patient's right side. Likewise, this is the left side of the skull. In the other image, we have a lateral perspective of the skull. That means we are looking at the skull from the side. This side of the skull is the anterior and this is the posterior or the back of the skull. The skull is a story of two halves. We have the viscerocranium, which is coloured in pink. The viscerocranium describes the skull bones that form the face, whereas the neurocranium is made up of bones that house the brain. All the bones of the skull, except the ear bones, the hyoid and the mandible, articulate by, via sutures. This means that they are connected by sutures. Sutures are a fancy way of saying that the bones have become fused together. A lot of these bones are fused before a fetus is even born. But some bones of the neurocranium don't completely fuse until about 18 months later. You may know these as a fontanelle. Let's just try and collate some key points about the skull. The skull is made up of 22 bones. Most of these are paired bones. That means they come in twos. They articulate or connect, except for the mandible, via sutures that are completely fused when they are approximately 18 months old. The viscerocranium describes the facial bones and finally the neurocranium describes the bones that house the brain. So let's move on and look at the viscerocranium first. The first bone we are going to look at is the one that dominates our face, the maxilla. The maxilla forms our upper jaw and it contains the teeth uh, and the roof of our mouth. It can be quite difficult to visualise the 3D aspect of the maxilla. So let's swap onto a photogrammetry to have a look at the maxilla in 3D. This model represents the left maxilla. The maxilla is one of the very many paired bones of the skull. We are currently looking at the maxilla from an anterior view. If I turn the model to the left, we can see it from the lateral perspective. And if I turn it to the right, we can see it from the medial perspective. The maxilla runs from the floor of the orbit, your eye socket, and travels inferiorly to your teeth. Also, we can see from an inferior aspect that it forms the front of the part of the roof of your mouth. If you run your tongue behind your front teeth, you are rubbing the roof of your maxillary. We can see that there is a rough edge here. This is called the zygomatic process, where the next bone of the, zyg the zygomatic joins to. The two zygomatic bones, as seen here, are the bones associated with cheekbones. They form the lateral wall of your orbit and the apples of your cheeks. You can feel these bones comfortably if you draw your fingers from the outside corners of your eyes and across to the level of your ear. On this photogrammetry, the yellow bone, labelled 1 and 3, is the zygomatic bone. Label 4 is the zygomatic arch, and if I rotate this to look more inferiorly, 
we can see that the arch of this bone leaves a nice space to accommodate for the coronoid process of the mandible. Let's have a little break now and look at a couple of the less complicated bones. What is important to bear in mind before we move away from the zygomatic and the maxilla is that a blow to the maxilla and the zygomatic can permanently damage the eyeball as they form the majority of the floor of the orbit. The small nasal bones are situated at the level of your upper eyelid. They do not extend all of the way down the bridge of the nose. This is cartilage. But you can gently palpate these bones if you press either side of your nose between the upper and the lower eyelids. The lacrimal bones form the medial walls of the orbit and should not be attempted to palpate as you would be rubbing the inner corners of your eye. The lacrimal bones are small and very fragile. It has a small channel that allows the collection of tears during excessive lacrimation, aka crying like when you are learning the bones of the skull. The mandible is our next pit stop on our collection of viscerocranial bones. The mandible is another name for the lower jaw. This is not a paired bone. It houses our lower mandibular teeth and plays a pivotal role in mastication, or the act of chewing. For the next bones, we need to dissect out the lateral skull. We have performed a sagittal cut, meaning we are cutting down the centre of the face between the eyes and down the middle of the nose through the middle of the chin. So on this image, we are looking at a medial view of this sagittal cut. The brain would sit here and the eye would sit just the other side of this bone here. The next bones are the nasal concha and these form the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. We can see these bones here. From the anterior, these bones are only just visible through the left and the right nasal apertures. And sagittally, we can see the right nasal inferior concha forming the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. We can also see another bone from the same anterior sagittal view. This is the vomer, an unpaired bone that divides the nasal cavity into left and right halves. We need to adapt another view of the skull now in order to see the bones from the dorsal aspect of the hard palate. The image on the right we are now familiar with, but the image on the left is an inferior view of the skull, having had the mandible removed. We can see the teeth of the maxilla, and these are our upper teeth. We can also see the zygomatic arches. These form the bridge of the cheekbones. The palatine bones are identified here in blue. If you move your tongue or run your thumb over the roof of your mouth, you can feel hard bones of the maxilla. If you move further back, be careful not to gag, you can feel the edge of these bones as you begin to palpate the soft tissue. These palatine bones are forming this edge and these divide the oral cavity into the hard and soft palates. This is where we'll end our journey on the viscerocranium and move on to the neurocranium. The neurocranium, remember, is formed from the bones of the skull that are housing the brain. And for the first view, we are going to revert back to our complete skull images. The complete anterior view on the left and the complete lateral view on the right. The first bone to consider is the frontal bone. This is largely what makes up our forehead and it forms the superior wall or the roof of our orbit or eye socket. Infrolaterally, it is articulating with the zygomatic bones and posteriorly, it articulates with the parietal bones. The frontal bone is an unpaired bone and this bone in particular is quite thick and sturdy to protect the brain from injury. It also articulates with the nasal and the maxillary bones anteriorly on its lateral, and on its lateral edge articulates with the sphenoid, which we will discuss in a few minutes. The parietal bones here. These are paired bones that meet along the top of the head in the midline and fuse along a parietal suture. 
also known as the sagittal suture. These bones are also thick and protect the top of the brain from injury. These bones articulate as discussed with the frontal, but they also articulate posteriorly with the occipital bone. Laterally, they meet with the sphenoid and the temporal bones. Where the sphenoid, temporal and parietal bones join is the weakest part of the skull. This is known as the pterion. It just under this runs a middle cerebral artery and consequently an injury to this area can have huge consequences in the form of an extradural haemorrhage. This image shows the temporal bones, the bone that protects the brain from the areas around the ear. This bone can be divided into two regions. The anterior part is most commonly referred to as the temporal region, whilst the area behind the external acoustic meatus or ear hole is described as the mastoid region, where we can see the mastoid process and the mastoid stylus. The next image will require us to look at the skull from another angle once again. If we focus on the lateral image on the right, we are going to cut the calvaria, or the skull cap, off. Then we are going to look into the cavity. To orient you further, the nose would be here, and the back of the head would be here. This shows us the occipital bone, that forms the majority of the posterior cranial fossa so the area where most of the posterior brain and the cerebellum will sit. This bone has a huge hole in it, called the foramen magnum, which allows the medulla of the brainstem and the spinal cord to exit the cranial cavity and move down the spine. We also have an anterior and a middle cranial fossa. The anterior cranial fossa is home to most of the frontal lobe, whilst the middle cranial fossa provides a bed in which the temporal lobes of the brain sit. Thankfully, there are only two more bones that we are interested in today, which we'll move on to now. The first one is the ethmoid bone. This unpaired bone allows nerves to travel for olfaction or to smell. It's a quite a fragile bone and susceptible to damage resulting from a blow to the face, such as boxing or a car crash. In such circumstances, it can be possible to severely damage the olfactory nerve and produce anosmia, or loss of smell. Our last bone is quite complex, and yet it is a very significant bone. This is the sphenoid. This large bone is shaped somewhat like a butterfly, which we will look at in a minute. And although it is considered anatomically to be part of the neurocranium, it forms a bridge between the neurocranium and the viscerocranium. We could see in this image that it articulates with the temporal, frontal, zygomatic bones. But on this image, we could see it articulates anteriorly with the palatine bones too. It also forms a small part of the anterior and the middle cranial fossa. In order to get more of an appreciation for this sphenoid, let's have a look at the photogrammetry. We are looking at the sphenoid from a posterior aspect. So we are looking at the back of the sphenoid, and this is why you'll remember I said this bone reminds me of a butterfly. We have the body here, and we have the lesser wings here, and the greater wings. This bone has a number of holes in it to allow the passage of the cranial nerves to the appropriate organ systems. These holes are the optic canal, so these allow for passage of the optic nerve to the eye. We also have these fissures, which allow for the passage of some nerves to control the muscles of the eye. The foramen rotundum, which allows the passage of V2, the trigeminal, to enter the maxilla. And the foramen ovarum, which allows for the passage of the third part of the trigeminal nerve towards the mandible. Now we have looked at our first learning objective, let's go and have a look at the vulnerable regions of the skull. The word sutures and synchondrosis is going to be thrown about a bit now, but what are they? Well, although they are formed differently, there's quite a lot of overlap between the two. The sutures of the skull, also known as cranial sutures, are fibrous joints with a fracture-like appearance um, 
between the bones of the skull. The sutures are formed during the embryonic period, postnatally and later growth periods. The cranial sutures allow for sites of bone expansion. They ossify at different rates, but most sutures have ossified by the age of 20. Syngondrosas, however, are slightly different in that they are not fibrous joints, but instead are cartilaginous joints and are found at the base of the skull and the mandible. Both sutures and synchondroses are sinoarthrosis joints, meaning that they don't move. They are formed between the embryonic stage and over the first 20 years of life. Depending on age and skeletal growth, the sutures are seen at various states of fusion and ossification. Many sutures join together the bones of the skull. They connect and form junctions with each other. Sutures can be further divided uh, according to their location in the sutures of the neurocranium or sutures of the viscerocranium and the sutures between the neuro and viscerocranium. The latter are seen between the borders of the cranial bones belonging to the neurocranium and those belonging to the viscerocranium. Sutures and synchondroses are something we have compromised on throughout evolution. Any area in the body that forms a link is an anatomical weakness. We see this throughout the body in blood vessels and synovial joints like the knees and the elbows. And these are the joining of bones that form sutures and synchondroses are no exception to this rule. They are weak sites and susceptible to damage from trauma. Given that the skull is supposed to protect our brain and vital structures of the eye, mouth and nose, why have we evolved to have these weak areas? Well, due to the enormous size of our head in relation to the birth canal, in order for us to be evacuated during vaginal birth, the skull must be compressed. We need it to be malleable. It does this due to undeveloped cranial plates that form spaces called fontanelles. We will look at these in a few minutes. Additionally, our viscero and neurocranium need to grow to accommodate our ever-increasing brain size. So being able to form junctions has become necessary for allowing brain development an increasingly larger sized head. The rate at which sutures fuse and ossify is physiologically relevant. During childbirth, the fibrous joints provide malleable quality to the child's head, allowing the bones to move. In neonates, junctions are incompletely fused, leaving membranous gaps called fontanelles. Fontanelles are also often called soft spots. There are six fontanelles. The frontal, the occipital, the mastoid and the sphenoid fontanelles. The lateral pressures on the skull during birth allow for superior displacement of the parietal bones for easier passage, which can remain displaced for a few hours post-birth. The fontanelles form sutures. The coronal suture forms over the frontal fontanelle. The coronal suture is seen on both the lateral and superior sides of the skull. It is formed at the junction between the parietal bones and the frontal bone. It runs horizontally across the superior part of the skull between the middle and intersects at the opposite coronal suture. The coronal suture usually fuses around the age of 2 and ossifies around the age of 24. The squamous suture, named after the squamous part of the temporal bone, forms the suture between the temporal and the parietal. This is paired with one on the left and one on the right of the skull. The lamboidal suture forms at the occipital and forms between the occipital and the parietal bones. The lamboid suture is an inverted U-shape seen on the posterior cranium. It is formed at the articulation between the superior border of the occipital bone and the posterior edges of both parietal. In the middle of the posterior cranium, the lamboid suture meets with the sagittal suture forming a landmark called a lambda. It is shaped like the Greek letter lambda, after which it is named. The lamboid suture usually ossifies around the age of 26.
The occipital mastoid suture is formed by the articulation of the squamous part of the occipital bone and the temporal mastoid part. It looks like an oblique continuation of the lamboid suture. The occipitomastoid, parietomastoid and lamboid sutures intersect on the posterolateral sides of the skull and form a landmark known as the asteron. The occipitomastoid suture ossifies around the age of 16. The sphenosquamous suture is found on both lateral parts of the skull. It is a vertical suture between the anterior aspect of the temporal bone squamous part and the greater wing of the sphenoid and usually ossifies around the age of 10. One very significant suture is this one here. This is the pterion. The joining of the sphenoid, parietal, frontal and squamous part of the temporal bone. As said previously, the joining of things in anatomy is a weakness and this area is a prime example of this. And this weakness can be devastating. Immediately beneath the pterion, the middle meningeal artery, which branches from the maxillary artery, moves into the neurocranium to supply the meninges of the brain. This area of the skull is also the thinnest area, and a blow to this can result in the fracturing of this suture and rupturing of the artery beneath it. This would present as an extrajural haemorrhage, which can result in significant neural deficits or even death. During embryological development and childhood, sutures function as intramembranous growth plates and only fuse and ossify later in life. New bone is produced at the sutural edges. New bone is produced at the sutural edges as a result of scrupulously coordinated external stimuli. Delayed or restricted growth results in suture agenesis and wide open fontanelles. Moreover, excessive bone growth can also result in deformities of the skull. The frontal fontanelle closes between 12 and 18 months. The occipital fontanelle, also known as the posterior fontanelle, is at the junction between the sagittal and lamboid sutures typically closes around the first and second months of age. The minor fontanelles are paired and these are smaller and situated on the sides of the skull. They are the sphenoid and mastoid fontanelles. The sphenoid fontanelle is located between the temporal, is located between the temporal, sphenoid and the parietal bones, whilst the mastoid fontanelle is situated between the temporal, occipital and parietal bones. And that sums up the objectives for this video. You should now be able to identify the surface features of the face with the underlying bony structures and identify the vulnerable regions of the adult and the infant skull.